take a spin. Now you're in with the techno set. You're going surfing on the internet. Hey there, it's us again. This is my brother Peter, mom and dad, and I'm Dasha. Don't forget about me, little sis. The alcoholic brother from my mother's first marriage. All right, kids, get around. Got a little something to show you. Got a little, little video I've been working on. A little special, special treat for y'all. You might learn something, Dasha. You might learn something from this. It's an educational video. All right, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about Dre Gang, Hyper Pop, and the YDK aesthetic. You might learn something. You might learn something. Yeah, if you can, just press play, Dasha. There you go. All right, come on, let's go. Let's video. Play. Come on, let's go. Woo! Woo! In fashion, there's something called the 20 year cycle, meaning most trends will reappear 20 years after they were first popular. Doc Martens was widely popular in 92 and then came back in 2013. Chokers were all the rage in the mid 90s and then came back in the middle of the 2010s. And that 70s show was aired during the late 90s. Now, things will often come back not exactly as they were, but slightly transformed through the eyes of the current time, being used more as an inspiration for a modern reinterpretation. If Synthwave and Outrun represent the 80s and Vaporwave the 90s, then the next logical step would be for an upcoming internet music genre to take inspiration from the 2000s, or you know, the OOs. Enter Hyperpop. Hyperpop has been explained by people who are way more educated than me, so I'm not gonna try to do that today, but let me give you the basics in one quick minute. Hyperpop had its start around the mid 2010s, but back then it was more commonly referred to as PC music. PC Music is a label and collective started by producer AJ Cook as an exaggerated and sometimes ironic take on pop music. Some of the MVPs on the early roster were AJ Cook himself, Hannah Diamond, Girlfriend of the Year, Danny Hall, Easy Fun, and frequent collaborator, but not official member, Sophie. With their own take on pop, consisting of high-pitched vocals and bubblegum dance pop, they would eventually gather a cult following on SoundCloud. Over time, they would influence mainstream artists like Carly Rae Jepsen, Madonna and Charlie XCX, eventually leading to Cook being announced as Charlie's creative director in 2016. With Charlie and others adopting the new retro-futuristic sound, it would kinda break into the mainstream. I mean, kinda because we're not exactly there yet, but we're getting pretty close. Eventually, we would see new acts popping up with similar styles to the PC music sound like 100 Gex, Goopy, Slater, Dorian Electra and Rina Sawayama, among others. The scene got further attention when Spotify launched a hyperpop playlist in August of 2019, making it more popular than ever. When it comes to the influences of this genre and actual sounds, it's kind of a bit all over the place. It's high-pitched female sounding vocals, preferably auto-tuned, artificial sounding instruments and often but not always blown out sound design, similar to chiptunes and glitch music. In an interview with Pitchfork, 100 Gex mentions Nightcore remixes, Jesus, Uffy, Britney Spears and early one on Point Never as some of their influences. I would probably put these influences into three sections. In the first section, you have Nightcore, which basically consists of speeding up songs, making them higher pitched, and adding some anime aesthetics in the videos or album covers. The name is derived from Nightcore, a Norwegian duo who basically started this style. The second section is Eurodance. We're talking the music that was popular in Europe at the turn of the century. Artists like Bass Hunter, Alice DJ, Aqua, and DJ Sammy are some of the more notable. The third section is the mainstream pop of the early 2000s. We're talking Britney Spears, Spice Girls and Kylie Minogue. The songs that would belong on hits for kids and that's what I call music CDs. This influence can especially be seen on the works of Hannah Diamond and Charlie XX more recent albums. If I would describe hyperpop as a genre, I would say that it's kind of like sushi or other acquired tastes. At first, you almost throw it up. The second time you try it, it's fine. And then you start to 
kind of enjoy it. And from that moment, you are truly lost. Normal music, what even is that anymore? All I want is the sushi music. It just tastes so damn good. Suddenly, you are a part of this small little cult that appreciates this very niche music that no one else likes. And you know that if you'd ever put this music on during a party, your friends would look at you like you killed the goat and tried to summon yeah. Satan. What the fuck is this? What? What? What the fuck is this? It's music. It's music. It's, it's, this is garbage. It's beautiful. It also feels kind of empowering to be like, Oh, what I listen to? Is this extremely ironic, glitchy, anti-pop album by 100 Gex? You wouldn't get it. Now, you might be wondering, what does an experimental electronic music genre have to do with a group of Swedish kids and their cringy cloud rap? That group of kids consists of... Dude, producer, sad boys. Young Sherman, producer, sad boys. Gravity Boys, Echo 2K, producer, rapper, producer, white armor, rapper, blade, blade, and young Lil, sad boys. And they would become the two influential rap groups, Drain Gang and Sad Boys. I say two groups, but they're basically one group, kind of like a Swedish version of Odd Future. Their rise has mostly been spearheaded by Young Lin, a young rapper from Sweden rapping over beats made by Young Sherman and Young Good, forming the Sad Boys crew. If you were hanging on YouTube during 2013, you've probably heard Ginseng Strip, Hurt or Kyoto, some of the more popular songs. Alongside Sad Boys, another crew was being formed. Drain Gang, formerly known as Gravity Boys Shield Gang, is a collective consisting of Echo 2K, Blade, Tyboy Digital, Young Sherman and White Armor. Members Blade and Echo 2K had been childhood friends and formed the grindcore band Crossad at age 13. After moving on to rap, they would eventually form a friendship with Young Lin and become a part of the Sad Boys clique. Even though they are two distinct groups, they are still signed to the same label and there are a lot of crossovers. Drain Gang members are an occurring feature on Lean albums, as is Lean on Drain Gang albums. Young Good, who is a Sad Boys member, has produced whole albums for both Blade and Echo 2K while White Armor produced the most recent Lean album, Stars. Both groups have a rather similar style, underground cloud rap with lucid instrumentals. Oh, this is pure garbage! Drain Gang, and especially Blade, have adopted a more experimental sound with heavy autotune vocals achieving almost ethereal soundscapes. It's especially these types of tracks that have heavily influenced the current hyperpop scene. It should also be mentioned that Blade and Makatok curated the Hyperpop playlist on Spotify recently when they released their album Good Luck. Both Sherman and Blade contributed on the Hannah Diamond Reflections remix album. And Charlie XCX was supposed to have Blade and Young Lean feature on the Charlie album, but it was scrapped in the final cut. You know, if you needed some more proof of their ties to Hyperpop. Now, I used to have a really diverse taste in music. If you go on my Spotify page, you can see that I have like a list for each season of the year with the type of music that I'm listening to during that period. But now, for the first time since I started, I don't have a list for the current season. Winter of 2020-2021 has consisted of nothing but Blade for me. This man has taken control of my ears and I, I, I just can't stop. I'm constantly resisting the urge to play Blade when in social situations with my friends and strangers alike. Luckily, there's a pandemic going on, so I have to stick with the rhythm bots and gamer girls on Discord. And as I said on stream the other day, the thing is, okay, here, this is all time. This is like from when I got my Spotify account, which is probably ten more than yeah, it's probably ten years. I discovered Blade, I want to say like four months ago. And I've listened to Blade so much that is, he, he's on my all time sixth place. Do you know how much Blade that is? Now, that's enough about me and my obsession with this man. Let's talk aesthetics. What would a pinkest video be without a three way when? diagram. Not much of an in-depth video, if you ask me. To put the Y2K aesthetic into perspective, we are comparing it with the Vaporwave and Seapunk aesthetics. 
As you can see, the color palettes are pretty similar all across the board, neon pink and science supremacy forever. But what does the Y2K aesthetic aka K-Bug actually look like? First off, the Y2K aesthetic isn't exactly an accurate representation of what was super popular or mainstream during the early 2000s. It's more the things that we in the late 2010s and early 2020s extract from that era. Similarly to how Outrun is based on retrofuturism from the 80s and Vaporwave retrofuturism from the 90s, Y2K is based on retrofuturism from the 2000s. Designs and products that are so clean that they look like they are made out of plastic. Everything had this feeling of being from a different futuristic dimension. While we might look at it today and say that it looks fake or too clean, back then this was considered futuristic. Shiny metallic products like the transparent plastic coating on tech products like the iMac G3 series, Game Boy Color, Pucci and Nintendo 64 among others. If you want a deeper dive into the tech part of the Y2K aesthetic, check out Bob Dunga's video in the description. Similarly to Vaporwave and Seapunk, the Y2K aesthetic is full of 3D graphics. Liquid, bubbly, futuristic renders similar to what we've seen before, especially in the Seapunk aesthetic. Mostly presented as extremely glossy and not very detailed. The graphics basically have to look like something that could have been made back when 64 megabytes of RAM made you the slickest kid on the block. Mom! Mom! Come look at the frames I'm getting in Condition Zero! Now, I'm not much of a fashionable man, but let's take a quick look at it either way. The early 2000s aesthetic was all about a flat stomach, preferably showed off with some low-rise jeans and a crop top. Some other prominent accessories were colored rimless sunglasses, these kind of soft pyjamas type sweatpants, and silver eyeshadow. Also this thing called a bedazzler that the girls who didn't talk to me would put on all their clothes. Bedazzle a hat, a shirt, bedazzle a belt, bedazzle a... Hey, Valentino, white face! If you want to know more, just look at pictures of the legends Paris Hilton, Aaliyah and Ashanti during this era. Or you know, the Bratz dolls. While we are on to Bratz, I guess we should also mention this western anime style that was very prominent during the era as well. I'm talking Kim Possible, the Witch comics, the SingStar game covers and of course my personal favorite, Totally Spice. I think I can speak for all men saying that when our sisters suggested to watch Totally Spice instead of Cubics and we were kind of like, uh, but Cubics is so much cooler. Totally Spice is so silly and girly. Okay, I guess I can watch it, but this is against my will. Yeah, we were all straight up fucking lying. Totally Spice was the coolest shit to ever bless our old Nokia TV. Let's talk thoughts. If you want to make some Y2K aesthetic stuff, you gotta implement some of these bad boys. In this image, I've used a font called Changeling Neo by Mark Simonson to represent the aesthetic. It has these kind of small and tight shapes with a lot of hard 90 degree angles that just exuberates retro futurism. It's also kind of similar to the supporting font the Design Republic made for Wipeout. And if you want a similar font but with round edges, try Euphoric Heavy Regular. I also recommend the font Black Han Sans for those blocky square Asian characters. Korean to be specific, but who's gonna know this? When we look at the title card for the Powerpuff Girls, we can see this fat, almost disco-y font that's a bit tilted to the right or italicized. Similarly to this font from the logo for Technodrive by Namco. Add a couple of strokes on the outside of that font and voila! You got yourself a pretty Y2K aesthetic logo. We also have this style which I've heard been called Molten Chrome. It consists of hand-drawn fonts made to look like chrome metal. This combined with some iridescence Iridescence? Iridescence. This combined with some iridescence is the most Y2K you can get, pretty much. There's also another part of the hyperpop aesthetic that's a little more lo-fi and glitchy feeling. This subgenre called glitchcore is mostly associated with the up-and-coming hyperpop artists such as Asquin, Dollywood, CM10, Curtains and David Shoddy. Is it its own musical subgenre? Is it an aesthetic? Uh, let's check back in with it in 2022 and we'll see. 
In the polar opposite direction of the white decay aesthetic, we have these hyper-polished, retouched images that look more like promotional pictures for Britney Spears or TLC back in the early 2000s. The perfect example of this photographic style is Hannah Diamond's work. The interesting thing about Hannah Diamond is that when she met AJ Cook, she wasn't really an artist. Well, I mean, she wasn't really a musical artist, she was a visual one. Photography and graphic design were her fields of expertise. But AJ Cook was like, fuck it, let's make you a pop star. Or, you know, fuck it, let's make you a pop star. She has this glossy, almost too perfect style in her photography, including a lot of retouching and emphasis on technology, channeling the perfect retrofuturistic aesthetic of the early 2000s. On her Live at Appleville official performance, the visuals consist of her editing and retouching a promotional picture. Her Instagram, basically like a style guide for the white 2 k aesthetic, and you know, we got tons of cool pictures here, and what? A blade? An Echo 2K? On Hannah Dimes Instagram? It's all connected, man. If I had to describe the Drain Gang aesthetic in one word, it would probably be noisy. From their epileptic inducing lo-fi music videos to their crowded album art, they always push it to the extreme. The Drain Gang aesthetic kinda reminds me of those monster energy drinking kids you would have in middle school with the baggy pants and hoodies. You know, kinda like Jesse Pinkman in the first few seasons of Breaking Bad. Both Blady and Echo 2K are visual artists. They made most of the album covers for the Drain Gang releases, as well as some for Lean and other artists. It's kind of rare that you see artists with such a hand-on approach to the visual part of their music, but these boys really do go the extra mile. Most Drain Gang music videos are also made internally. Cheap and low budget perhaps, but it lets the boys put their own specific style on their visuals. You never really know what's going on in a Drain Gang music video. Usually, the camera work is the shakiest in the biz, the camera only records in 240p, and colors are usually muted or just straight up inverted. To be honest, none of us actually know what Blade looks like. Their graphic and merch design features a lot of clip art, some lens flares and fonts that are kind of similar to heavy metal band logos. The hyperpop genre is highly derivative of the early 2000s pop scene, and it therefore makes sense that the visual artists would try and pull influence from that era. I think one of the reasons the Y2K aesthetic has become more popular recently and looked back on with fondness is because we are getting so tired of the emotionless flat design standard that we see around us all the time. In our hunger for something that is a flat logo with one or two colors, we look back on the 3D text and the bevels of the 2000s with a new appreciation. There was more personality back then, more flair and the hunger to be unique. And to be fair, you know, I like minimalism, but somehow, one day, everyone just decided to use these types of illustrations and I swear to god I'm gonna go fucking insane if I see another big tech company enforcing this style upon me. And that's the rant for today. If you want more inspiration for the Y2K aesthetic, take a look at the Y2K Aesthetic Institute on Twitter and Tumblr, as well as the Y2K Lost and Found Tumblr and the Y2K page on Aesthetics Wiki. Also, check out authentic designs by people like Paul Nicholson, aka Number 3, Designers Republic, and Mitsu Katsui. And also more contemporary work by people like Glitchmood, Hannah Diamond, Vatne, Amjesaya, Lord Stingray, and Igor Lorok. I've also made a hyperpop playlist that I keep updating, link in description as always. Other than that, thank you for joining me on this journey and I hope we can meet again. Huge amount of work to be done socially and culturally and the, the, the gap between where we are now and I imagine where we could be and the places that our imaginations can take us are so far away from what we're presented with a lot of the time. So. I, I can't get too excited about anything happening now. I'm really excited about what should be happening in the future, what hopefully will happen.